Welcome, Kim. Welcome, everybody. So um, thank you for being here, part of Pilates Round. What we've been trying to, um, oh, thank you, Esther. Got a message. No problem. Just feel free to pipe in anyone whenever you like. I'm really excited to have new people in this group all the time. And um, what I what I love what I'd love for us to be able to do in this group is come together as a community, talk about cases that are maybe a little bit more challenging, or and help each other. So as a community, help each other do better in our practice of Pilates and caring for people. With our ultimate goal being always to have kind of a client-centered approach and um, help us just move all in the right direction. Um, so I thought that I would start off with just presenting a case study. And then if, if somebody else has a case study in particular that they want to present, that would be fantastic. And if um, in the future, if you wanted to send me a message before the course and really cover a particular case study or questions that you have, I can definitely address those. So if we don't get to something that you want to present today, please just send me a message and we'll be sure to get to it next time and just share thoughts on, on that. So um, I will start if you guys are okay with it. on presenting, uh, I wanted to bring to light just because it's probably gonna become more and more a common theme, a post COVID case study, which I find as uh, a new client for me that I've only seen, uh, I've spoken to twice and actually had an official visit with her just once. Um, I thought it was particularly interesting because she is young, probably mid twenties, and she had a long, strange history with the whole thing, and it wasn't 100% diagnosed with COVID. So there's still a little bit of a question even around whether or not she actually had COVID. Her symptoms are um, so she actually had was diagnosed or became ill in March of last year. So it's been a year and a little bit now since her diagnosis. She went from being a completely healthy, active Pilates student, not at our, at our studio, elsewhere, um, and also just active young adult and got really, really ill and her lungs primarily were affected. So uh, she came to the point where she could not uh, walk up a flight of stairs without having to rest uh, and stop along the way. She then um, did not recover very well. So she kept having all these issues until December of this uh, 2019. And she finally turned a corner, she said she started to have a little more energy and started to be able to exercise a little bit. And so she was also, they checked her for all kinds of other illnesses. There was a pneumonia, a, a kind of pneumonia and lung infection that she was diagnosed with. And she was also uh, potentially diagnosed with fibromyalgia. But again, it's a little bit uncertain if it's actually fibromyalgia or a result of like a post-COVID syndrome or post-illness syndrome for her. And so now her goal, she's come to us to work on um, getting back to her strength. She's lost all her muscle tone pretty much. She's not been able to do much exercise. She's trying to get back. She's just really eager to get back into moving and strengthening at this point. And so we had a visit, a uh, really first true visit this past week. And she presented with um, some pain, muscle aches is her primary complaint still, muscle aches and pain, with uh, five with her breathing, which is one of my concerns. I asked a lot of questions around how was her breath. Um, and so, and I took this lesson pretty slow, I think a little bit to her dissatisfaction, just because I wanted to see where she was. And if it is truly a fibromyalgia type reaction that she's having, I was concerned about taking things too quickly because sometimes with fibromyalgia, they can just fatigue right after. And so I wanted her to, we talked a lot about journaling and keeping track of her symptoms so that next time I see her, uh, we can progress along. So I um, just wanted to throw that out to you, talk a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of COVID. Um, there's, I don't know if any of you have also had any 
work with COVID, post-COVID syndrome at this point? Anyone else? No? Okay. So I'll just talk a little bit about what the range seems to be. So I would say that this is an extreme situation, especially her being so young, that she would have symptoms this far out after. Um, muscle aches is one of the primary complaints of people who have COVID. I've also heard of things like um, rapid heart rate or changing heart rate rhythm, uh, people who are losing hair post COVID syndrome, um, people who have continued muscle aches and uh, especially a lot of fatigue for a long time after COVID, even six, eight months like this young woman, it's pretty common that people are having fatigue syndrome, fatigue syndromes afterwards. Um, and so let's see, yes, it said a message to you. Let me see if I can read that. Uh, sorry, I'm having a hard time reading it. Oh, there we go, the chat. Um, the association against students, all the students were in their 20s and healthy, yeah. So I think um, it'll be interesting to see as students, people start coming back now, if they're gonna stay, if they're coming back and some of them may have had COVID and what changes they might have seen. So I, I think, you know, a couple of things and, and lungs can be affected for a long time after as well. Lungs and there's sometimes there's heart issues that can be affected. The heart muscle can be affected a little bit. So building back, I think in, thinking in terms of rebuilding and in terms of cardio also as part of maybe what we need to think about as health, health, health helpers in terms of helping these people get back to fitness level. So um, a couple things that come to mind. One is checking breathing and spending some time helping people who have had any sort of lung issue get back to full, full rib cage full belly, full air in and out, which fo follows right along with our Pilates principles. So I think maybe spending a little extra time on breathing is a great thing to start somebody back. And you'll have to gauge and see how far along the, the client is. There's gonna be a huge range, but I definitely would go into some breath work. So that's where I started with this young woman. And then we started pretty slow. I wanted to, to make sure that she had some core stability or core awareness back in her body. Um, she was pretty, I think, mobile before, really kind of maybe on the hypermobile side. So it just seemed very loose and a little disconnected to her middle. So we spent some time just going back to the basics. We, I like to coin some of the exercises as kind of the basic back routine where I take them back through breathing, coccyx curl, predicting the load, um, which is basically like the tabletop, just uh, finding their stability again. And then uh, moving into the modif a modified version of the five, just to get their abs going again. Uh, also great work on posture and opening the chest would be fantastic. So anything that opens and gets them breathing uh, and width in here. And then this young woman really wanted to progress. So we got her on the reformer, did some footwork, had her start moving again. And she's really hoping to get moving more next week. She's also doing a lot of walking now outside, which I think is great. And encouraging that movement would be great as well for her. So, um, but I think also just coming back to if somebody's been ill for an entire year, thinking about what their muscle tone might be like after a year of not being able to exert. And when the lungs are that compromised, their endurance is gonna be down. So maybe, working through maybe doing footwork and maybe even thinking about adding a little pinch to the footwork if their form is good, right? So not just our slow controlled perfection of alignment. If they're good enough, maybe part of what we want to do is, is get them moving and let their heart rate get up just a little bit on the reformer. For example, footwork's usually pretty safe, so that might be a nice place to do that, to progress them along. And then start building in more strength work and just our whole body workout, I think would be fantastic for them. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Comments, questions? Sorry, I have yeah. a question, hi. Oh, I was just wondering her, uh, like, is she, a, um, is she like normal weight? That's what I was just wondering, is she normal weight? 
Yeah, good question. So in her case, I think she's put on a bit of weight than it uh, sounds like. I didn't ask directly, but um, she definitely, she's not underweight, but what I feel like is she doesn't have a lot of muscle tone anymore. So listening to what she was before, my assumption is that she was a lot stronger before and maybe some of that muscle has, um, she's lost some of that tone. So I think for her, toning the muscles would be key to helping her get back to her strength. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Astrid. Really good idea to focus on breath. Suits get tired quickly. Um, I think they were all stronger before. And I totally agree, Astrid, saying that um, people seem to have um, tiring quickly I think that that is very true across the board people who are ill and people who are not ill we've had a lot of clients who just didn't take care of themselves during the COVID and have relapsed in terms of pain who have um, lost their endurance a lot so um, I think yeah going always going back to the basics what's so beautiful about our Pilates repertoire right is that we incorporate the whole body so much so just taking a general repertoire working on breath, starting at those basics again, finding strength from within and strength from the breath is a really great way to help people start moving again. Yeah. What, yeah, option one rather than more challenging option two. I think it'll take a few weeks. Um, yeah, I agree. I think it's gonna take a little time for people to get back to wanting to get, get um, push harder. I think just getting moving again is the key for a lot of people. Yeah, thank you. Great comment. Um, any other thoughts or questions? I really would just encourage to uh, be aware of where the clients may be, because I think sometimes um, they, again, this, in this young woman's particular case, I, I almost feel like I need to be a little careful and hold her back just a little bit because she really wants to get going and get back to who she is. But my fear is that I will push too hard and she will get exhausted. And if she has um, fibromyalgia, um, it will make it, uh, it will make her tire out even more. So we just need to take it step by step. Are you guys familiar with fibromyalgia? And the yes, this is that. Okay. Yeah. Kim, did you have a comment? Sorry. Yes. I did, I did, I did add a question. So given yeah. that she is pretty young, um, we have to find that balance between, or comment, between uh, not get, starting slowly with the breathing, but yet giving her enough challenge or enough movement that she doesn't feel like it's boring. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Because I, I think, sorry. That was a little bit of the sense that you had of her yesterday, the other day, mm -hmm. I think, that she was kind of like, well, I'd like to move a little bit more. So anyway, that's that I challenge. Agree. So thoughts on that would be great. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's, uh, I think if she hasn't come in with uh, a diagnosis of fibromyalgia, the fibromyalgia always makes me worry a little bit. It's... Um, because you can, somebody who actually really has, and again, her diagnosis isn't 100% certain on the fibromyalgia. They're just, they're not sure if the muscle aches and pains are post-COVID or fibromyalgia related. So um, I think I always hold back a little bit on fibromyalgia, especially the first session, because I'm worried that if I push too hard, I'll, I'll put them out for an entire week. And sometimes I don't even think I'm pushing very hard and somebody is hurting for a week. Uh, so I, I will wait for her feedback, but if she's fine and had no repercussion from that first session, then I will push her to where she thinks she wants to be and also ask her the same thing to really just take note of where, how she feels the day. But I like to do the 24 and the 48 hour after. And I ask them to also write down a few things about their, um, about what else they did in their day. You know, we, we only get them for that hour. And if I work with her for an hour and then she ends up um, working in her garden for an hour because it's a beautiful day, but she's not worked in her garden for the last eight months, then we're all, 
I'm also not sure if that's the work we did or the fact that she works in the garden that's causing the problem. So it's great if they start journaling too, because then we know if it's what we did or not that's causing the discomfort. So, but yeah, you're right. We have to meet the client where they are and give them what they want, but also be a little bit protective with them. Yeah. Great. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I have noticed that um, when, for my classes, I, I teach both mat and I also teach reformer. And for my mat classes, I also teach via Zoom while I'm doing a live class. And I'm noticing the shift has happened. So basically what's happened is I used to have 11 people online and two people live. And now this week it radically shifted to about 12 people in person and only two people online. And I honestly attribute that to people getting the vaccine. For some reason, uh, I don't know how many of you are pro-vaccine or anti, I'm not gonna get into that discussion, but I am concerned that people feel that getting the vaccine is gonna do it. It's like, it's giving them like false sense of, I'm the kind of person I have to be honest, I'm saying it outright. I'm a very healthy individual. I really eat cleanly. I really stick to everything. I, I sleep the hours I need. I work out the hours I need. Uh, I don't eat Cheetos. So I'm saying my immune system is Cracker Jack. So I don't take the flu shot. I have no intention of getting the COVID shot uh, unless I'm forced, but I'm saying that I'm concerned with people who are using the COVID shot the same way they use um, anti-inflammatories from the doctor. Okay, I could do everything and this will fix it. So you getting the COVID shot and you coming to my class and you forgetting all the other protocols you need to do, like eating well, which is the number one protocol, that's not gonna do it for you. It's not gonna help you. So that's, that's where I come into concern. And at my Pilates studio, we're very uh, diligent and we wear masks and we clean and we're cleaning everywhere. But again, I'm still concerned with the people who feel that the shot, getting the shot is the reason why they can come out into the world again. It's like a false mm -hmm. sense of security. I personally don't feel like that's gonna help you if you're going to, pull back and not eat cleanly and not exercise all the time and not get a good night's rest. All those things help you mind, body, and soul. If you're not going to practice that, the same like with your client, if she doesn't get her immune system up to speed, nothing will ever work. So that's the way I live my life. I've been very successful at it. And I instill that in my clients. And that's what I, I practice what I preach. And I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think I think you bring up some great points. I think we need to be still really diligent. And I mean, the research is out there. They do, there's not enough research to know how well these vaccines are going to work, how much they're going to protect, and people are still going to get ill. I think the hope is just that they won't get as severely ill with it. And so hopefully we're preventing a lot of um, the severe cases of people passing away from the illness. But yeah, I think you're right, especially, and I think as holistic practitioners, which I think most of us in the Pilates community are very holistic and health conscious. Um, I think it's really great to set a wonderful example like that and to set that example at the studios. And we are also um, over in Jennifer, they're also super, super diligent about keeping the studio clean, about keeping appropriate spacing, about mask wearing, hand washing. Um, we have no intention of stopping that until we're sure that there's not a risk really for people or until this goes away. And perhaps, you know, I'm also a physical therapist. I've, all, I've been thinking and talking to a few physical therapists about the fact that perhaps the mask wearing for physical therapists needs to stay if we're doing physical therapy work. Maybe we should continue to wear masks for quite some time, especially even during flu season and things like that, that maybe that some of these protocols are not such a bad idea um, long term. I think with Pilates, it's a little more difficult because people are exercising. It's not really as comfortable to wear a mask necessarily, but as a physical therapist, perhaps keeping a mask on 
with clients may not be such a bad idea. Well, do you, I, wear, I, do you wear masks? Does everyone wear masks when teaching their classes? Because we do and our, our, and our yes. clients and students do. Mm -hmm. um, so. but, but not everybody is masked, um, which is, you know, clients, students, everybody, which is, I think, essential right now. I'm hoping that in the future, it won't be such a high risk that even the, the clients have to wear masks. Because I think sometimes I get uncomfortable. If I can't run with a mask on, for example. So if we're really working hard, it's hard to breathe while you're the student, I think. But as an instructor, or as a physical therapist, I, I, it's not, it doesn't bother me when I'm doing manual work on somebody to be wearing a mask. So maybe that could be even a more long-term thought process that we go through. Um, and maybe as an instructor, we don't need to... Um, even when she, I was just saying that if they wear masks, even when she's taking a dance class, they're wearing masks. I think, I think that's the right thing to do right now, for sure. Um, but yeah, keeping the protocols and encouraging healthy lifestyle, I think that is part of what we do. And setting the example, like you're saying, Phyllis, is fantastic. I think people really do watch what we're doing. I say watch what we're wearing. <laughs> they watch everything we do. So I think exactly. if we're eating well, and practicing good health, I think that that's really key. And if we're practicing these precautions, hopefully we can keep instilling in them in a quiet kind of way that we feel that it's really important for them to continue as well. So yeah, I really appreciate it. And, and I, I'm sure by now all of you have been touched by somebody affected with COVID. Um, I had one of my cousins who's 57 just passed away. Um, so, you know, it really hit hard and, and um, you just don't know. So I think keeping these precautions is really, really key until we're really in the clear here. Um, but then the cleaning protocol should stay, in my opinion, definitely long term. But yeah, Allegra, go ahead. Yeah, just just yeah. getting back to more of the breathing with um, this client, um, you know, one of the things that Pilates, Joseph Pilates talks about is just, you know, how important the breathing is. And, you know, I know just from study, you know, like a lot of singers even use Pilates because it helps with that, you know, to get the diaphragm and the breathing. And so, cause I know for a lot of our clients, um, you know, the, the getting the breathing is, I mean, some more than others is the correct breathing is, you know, very challenging sometimes. And, um, is that something that like you would try to focus on more with this kind of client to get that kind of proper breathing to just help with, you know, everything. And, um, so yeah, I'm just, just wondering about that. Like how much would you emphasize that? Yeah, so that is a fantastic question. And I think there's more than one right answer. Uh, and I think looking at the client specifically, somebody who's had a lung infection or a lung issue, which I'm gonna categorize COVID as that for now. Uh, I think it's really key that they do get that, learn how to use their lungs again. So full expansion, getting all the breath in, getting all the breath out, squeezing all, every atom of air out is what Joe Pilates was saying. I think he really had a point. And if we think back to when he was using Pilates, when he started in the hospital with uh, people who were in hospital, he was helping them. They weren't getting pneumonia and secondary illnesses, the ones that he was exercising. And part of that, like other people who weren't exercising, you know, a lot of them were injured from war and they were in a hospital, right? So he was exercising them, they didn't end up dying from pneumonia like some of the others that weren't exercising, which isn't what they came in for in the first place. And maybe we could attribute some of that to the fact that they were using their lungs and moving their bodies um, and staying healthier because they were doing that. So I, and I think if somebody's had, like even people who have had uh, COPD, which is a long, chronic lung disease, I, I've been, I think many of you had seen me working with, um, I had two clients who came in with oxygen, right? And we would work with the oxygen tank right there because they had chronic lung diseases. They would feel so much better after doing the work. Um, so I think, it, but it does take a certain kind of person. Like this young woman didn't want to spend that much time working on her breathing. She felt like her breathing was okay. She wanted to get moving. Like that was her Thing. So I think you need to find a balance. I want to meet her. I want to meet the client where they are, but I also can keep coming back. So a lot of times I'll start with some, and actually all my group classes, I've gotten more and more into taking a few minutes at the beginning of the class just to get people to settle 
and to feel their breathing and notice their breathing. And then we start moving through the exercises. And I, I think that all of you have those people who you start doing coccyx curl and bridging and you're trying to do the breathing and they can't get the pelvis motion and they can't get the breath and they get so confused. It's at times like that that I sometimes say, you know what, forget the breathing, let's get some motion. We just create emotion in the body and then I try and add the breath back in. So I want, the breath is an important component, I believe, and also just not breath holding. I think that's really important as well, just keeping some breath flowing. But sometimes if it's uh, stunting any movement at all, I'll choose one or the other, right? So I'll say, okay, let's focus on the breathing right now. Okay, now let's get some movement. And then we'll try and incorporate the breathing with the movement just to start developing a coordination. And then our ideal, I think is that eventually we have everybody doing nice breathing with nice motion that is all coordinated, but all of you have seen how discoordinated people can become, right? So does that help? It's a kind of a non-answer, but yeah. Yeah. It depends on yeah. the person and the setting and everything, but um, you know, just yeah. like slowly, you know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so if you don't have um, more questions on that, do any of you have a case study in particular that you would like to present? <laughs> okay, if not, I have more. I always have more, yes? Oh, I think, right. I think Genevieve had one, or was that, did oh, I? Oh, Genevieve, go ahead, I'm sorry, Genevieve. Um, it's, it's, the person who I brought up a, a few weeks ago, I saw her again today and um, she, she's the one who had a lot of stuff going on, um, some pelvic floor PT in the past um, and you've got hip stuff, ankle stuff, um, mainly complaining about her ankle, um, but there seems to be like a direct feedback happening, something happening from hip pelvic floor ankle um, and she said that her ankle was feeling much better after the exercises that I gave her to do at home um, but then something happened she said she thought it was she went to go try and release her I'm thinking she was trying to release her psoas on that same side um, as the ankle problem and then her ankle went all bad um, she, she mentioned that she was feeling really a lot tighter on that side in her abdomen and was trying to release that and sort of the hip a little bit as well. And then the ankle went bad and her inner thigh on that side got really bundled. Um, so my thought was that she had like, you know, it was sort of one of those things where one, one thing is always holding her together. Um, and then when you try and release that thing, it creates a train, chain, train, ugh, chain reaction. Um, so I'm curious about your thoughts on that. <laughs> um, we worked a bit today on, on like some, some abdominal awareness and trying to get her glutes to fire, um, which was interesting. Um, as in there's, there's not a whole lot going on there. Um, but then I was, I was curious about that inner thigh and pelvic floor interaction as well. Yes. Okay. That's a can of worms, isn't it? Um, so I just actually um, was looking up more about the fascial connection between the inner thigh, pelvic floor, ankle, in fact, I sent, I sent you, Genevieve and Kim, something about that from our last session about fascia and biotin integrity, but there's actually more there um, that you guys already know. And so let, let's talk about that because I think that that will help. One of the things that I, I think about a lot, wait, Genevieve, sorry, one question. When her ankle was all bad, what what does all that at her ankle mean? Like it's unstable, rolling, not able to articulate. Um, I think it to her it's pain. Um, 
And like, so what's interesting is I was trying to have her do something really basic like coccyx curl, some bridging, um, even holding legs and tabletop with some support and her ankle flares up when she does those things. Um, yeah. Okay. So it sounds like uh, something in the chain of events is causing the pain. Maybe it's not even weight necessarily pressure-wise on the ankle. Um, so I think there's two ways to think about it. One is if we come to the simple view it, and we look at alignment and what changes alignment down the chain. Right. So if we, if we talk about alignment, what I like to think about is imbalances, right? I mean, you guys have probably heard me talk on this before. It's interesting, Andy, you said her inner thigh bundled up, felt tight and bundled, and there's not a lot happening at her boot. So if we think about the anatomy of that, the pelvic region, we have inner thigh and we have not a lateral structure, right? We've talked about this before, it's fascial on the outside of the leg, right? It's IT band, which is mostly fascial and very small muscular contraction, TFL, right? TFL, if I remind you, I'm sorry if this is really basic, but just because I think it's good for visual sense. Um, so I'm gonna back up here. TFL, right, is gonna be right here. It's small, that big. And then I'm gonna end up at IT band down past my knee. Right? The only other contractile structure, so fascia, we, we can argue about how contractile fascia is. The bottom line is it's not a contractile muscle fiber like our TFL would be. Or what we have back here are our glutes, right? Hip rotators, piriformis, gamelli, internal, external obturators, right? And we have the glutes, glute medius, which is our lift up muscle, glute max to kick our legs back, glute min helping glute max and everybody else do their jobs a little bit, right? So we have these short fat muscles up here. We have short, thin TFL. And then we have two pubic bone, right? All the adductors, gracilis, adductor longus, adductor magnus, um, and patinous super short, right? So we've got long muscles crossing the knee on the inside, but we've got short fat muscles on the outside and then fascia. So if there's an imbalance, if I wanna take this, you're gonna lose my head, but you'll see my legs, right? If, if I'm gonna take this down the chain to my ankle, right? If, if this is affecting my ankle, my assumption, and, and I haven't seen her, but my assumption is that there's some sort of imbalance somewhere, either a pull out, which the, then the adductor is squeezing to help to, to like the life-saving force, or um, there's a shift in the pelvis that's causing the inner thigh to pull, that's dropping the ankle inward um, and tightening up the outer as well, probably, or just causing it not to be able to activate um, and then causing some funky alignment issue down at the ankle. So, so my guess is that one, one or the other is probably uh, likely to be occurring. Um, and then what do we do to address that? So yeah, yeah. That second. Say that again, I'm sorry. Sorry, it's definitely that second one. Um, her, that problem side, um, the, ink, the whole leg kind of turns inward a little bit and collapses inward. Um, and there's definitely something in the hip, right? So. Yeah, so um, it, maybe, you know, the hard part is, is she hypermobile as well, would you say, hypermobile person? I think she's got a little bit of hypermobility. Uh, yeah, it, it's hard to say, but like I had her do some stretches today and she's got like range of motion. Um, but no strength to put her there. Right. So yeah. Right. Okay. So, and we also know that muscles spasm when they're inefficient, right? So the adductors gripping means that they're not contracting properly, 
right? If they wouldn't be gripping and grabbing and holding if they were contracting properly. Um, so something is making that, that contraction not work properly. Maybe it's that they're weak and they grab because that's the only thing, like they're holding on for dear life, so they're grabbing. Or maybe the whole pelvis pubic bone is shifted and then the inner thighs went, ah, I've got to do something here. And that could be grabbing too. So, you know, you might come back to really basic. I think if, if you told me that she's really hypermobile, I'd be more worried about releasing and stretching the inner thigh. Um, if, so somebody is super hypermobile, I probably wouldn't go straight to open. Um, somebody who's contracted, what I want to do is actually see if I can do some retraining to, to check and fix that pubic bone alignment and to activate the muscle properly or to release it enough. So, and, and then remember opposing muscle groups, if one is holding, the other can't fire. So as we were talking about, right, we don't have the exact same structures in the size of the thigh. Like a quad and hamstring, if hamstring is spasming, we can fire quads and hamstring has to turn off. Like one really reacts well with the other. Inner thigh is a little more challenging because we don't have a structure right here that we can activate to release, but if this is grabbing, you're gonna have a really hard time getting into the glute. So we need to find a way to encourage that inner thigh to stop grabbing and get the glute to fire again. And so what you might think about are some really simple, easy activations for the inner thigh. Even though it's gripping like this, sometimes if you can get a little activation, a little pelvic floor, activation without her having to think about what that is, then you might be able to get the muscle to settle, relax and, and go, oh, life's not so bad after all. And then once you get that, then you can get back to the glute potentially. And even if you had to go into rotators, I find sometimes, and actually I had a client today that actually Allegra, you know too, that um, sometimes if you have to, to get into the glute and you can't, if you turn on, turn out and get into rotators first, that gives them some awareness and then move back to parallel and look for glute medius again. Sometimes you can get it that way too. But how do you get the inner thigh on when it's already in a spasm? I would say super gently. So back to sort of the ball between the knees. And what I would probably do is try a little turn in to activate the pelvic floor, right? So remember, if we activate inner thighs without us having to worry or think, we're automatically, just a gentle, right? So this is a submax contraction. We're not squeezing life out of our inner thighs. We're just holding, stabilizing. So holding, stabilizing inner thighs helps activate pelvic floor. If you take the feet and turn them in ever so slightly, and do that same action, you're actually helping pelvic floor a little bit more. So without even having to cue it. And then the other interesting thing is if you squeeze the inner thighs, the pubic bones open up, remember that, right? So squeezing inward with your inner thighs, pubic bones separate somewhat. Pressing outward, with, if you put the ring around and press out, you're gonna open a thigh joint. So in her case, I would probably go for inner, See if you can open the pubic bone because if the pubic bone is offset and you open a tiny bit, it might just find its way back into good alignment if that's what's causing that spasm. So, and, and then I would use her breath again, right? Because in that breath, right, we have, um, if, I, so if I go here and I turn in the feet a little bit, maybe you want to try this, right? I, I'm just putting a little minimal pressure. I'm going to stay in my I'm not forcing anything. Sorry, oops, maybe you can't see me all the way. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not forcing anything. I'm just holding with a little bit of intention. Taking a breath in and exhale. I'm settling. I'm letting myself just settle into the floor, letting my pelvis settle. And then from when I get settled here and let everything just sort of sink, if I give a little pressure inward, right, I am without needing to think about it, my pelvic floor is open. I'm creating a little space. And so I, I can put my hands here and feel a contraction, but I'm not squeezing and getting crazy. 
with that contraction. So I, I might go back to the first thing you just showed back to that little bit of the and exhaling, settling, and just let it be not to put some weight and put the weight in the right way. Dana? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Everything's turning your head toward us. We can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Okay. Is this better? Yeah. Yeah. I forgot this headset sometimes doesn't work when I'm lying down. Okay. So, um, Gently pressing inward, right? And allowing the body to settle on that exhale. So staying neutral, being careful not to get into the cross in front, even just to isolate and let the body, the breath in the body, lift the pelvic floor on its own and then release. So here, if I if I go light, lightly, I, I shouldn't be grabbing the inner thigh that's already grabbed. It should actually help it find length. Maybe have some of the other uh, inner thigh muscles kick in that aren't in the spasm and see if that can work. If, if that just creates more and more spasm, then maybe you do need to go to just gentle opening first, allowing time for that to open. And then coming back, you could even uh, just use it as a stabilizer instead of a moving one. So if it's her breath, for example, I could just hold the right leg in isometric and take the left one out and back towards it. Can't hear me? Nope, sorry. Oh, I'll sit up. So if I do it this way, you can hear me, yes? Yeah? yeah, okay. That's so funny. Sorry about that. So if I, I can... Um, if this one, say it's my right one that's in the spasm, if I can't get it out of spasm, what I might do is just hold this in isometric contraction and have my left leg just open and press back. So I'm not even changing the length of this adductor. I'm finding the place where it feels okay to hold it. And then having the other leg work as a stabilizer, you're still activating the muscles. It's just that it doesn't have to try and contract and release. It can just sort of hold in one position. So sometimes that will also help. And then hopefully, then you can take that. So progression wise, if that starts to work, um, I would start moving upward. But I find that I get more activation in our thigh um, when I start coming into the, these positions, right? So now I can use that wrapping around, feeling, squeezing in, connecting through. And that really gets me to lift right up in through here. So inner thighs connecting, low belly. I get the connection from pubic bone to belly button. I feel that lift and release. And all of that should help actually unwind, even though that inner thighs is in spasm. It should help unwind, keeping it sub, sub max, right? So not crazy squeeze. Right, light, really light, and then using that breath to help lift and lengthen. So, and then you could go back and see if you want to take it a step further. I'm going to put this up for you guys so can stand up. If I wanted to take it a step further, right, I can take it up to my stance position now. Same thing, keeping that wrapping, lifting. Right? And then taking myself up. So now I'm working back on that alignment in my foot and ankle. And what you might do, oops, you can see my feet. Is even encourage good alignment of the feet. So in order to do that, I like to do the toes spread out, lift up all the toes off the floor so that I can get the arches up and then set the toes down. That helps spread out across the calcaneus and across all the toes, right? And then I can wrap, lift, and let that carry me upward in through all the way up through my body, hopefully. Right, so you might just work kind of a lot of the session here. Here, the beauty is, right, as you know, that now I'm also standing on my hip. So the proper glute work should be happening. Progression, if this all goes well, right, would be then moving to one leg, doing that same thing, the same wrap lift and keeping myself stuck on top for glute medius. Right, wrapping, lifting, and stacking right on that leg. So that might be a progressive, you know, probably too far for her 
right now, I would say, but but that would kind of be how I would get back to the ankle. Maybe you could use that on the reformer, so get her to straight legs on the reformer and use that wrap lift and, straight, and, and stack. So you're not worried about balance. So you have a little more control. You know, she doesn't have to be in control of her center so much, but maybe you could get the legs sorted out a little bit if you did it on reformer. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm glad you, you validated what I did today. So. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, great. Nice job. <laughs> started with um, just like resistance and inner thigh squeezes on the, on the ball and had her do isometric holds with that as well. <clears throat> and then I did have her stretch her inner thighs just to see if there was like something crazy tight happening there. But then when she was like crazy open, I was like, okay, well, that's probably not. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and then we, I, I had her do some sideline to try and get the glutes on um, after all of that. Um, so like a little bit of success, but yeah, it's, I think, I also had her um, for the, the ankle because it kept gripping and, and getting wound up when she was doing nothing that should grip the ankle. Um, I had her do hamstring stretch with the uh, neural glide um, with the flex, flex and point of the foot. Um, and she seemed to like that. I don't know if that was, if that really is doing anything for her though in that sense, or if that's, what are your thoughts there? So what's interesting about uh, the neural glide, if you don't know, is getting somebody in a hamstring stretch, point and flex the foot. Uh, in keeping it in that sagittal plane, so not moving in and out of. And the idea is that it glides the nerve in the sheet. But the other thing you're doing in that position is opening the back leg fascia, right? The fascia from your glute down the back of your leg. So all the way to thoracolumbar, down the back of the leg, all the way into the calf, that posterior capsule, the posterior compartment of the lower leg, and into the plantar fascia, right? So we're taking that and you're actually gliding all of that. And for somebody who's been in the wrong alignment for a while, that fascial opening is probably a really great thing. So pointing and flexing with her on her back, having her seated, working um, just even here, pointing, flexing would be really great, I think. And then you could even, in her case, start working on... Um, moving out so lateral getting that whole lateral line working as well with the theraband perhaps or even in the straps working to the outside a little bit and back in to activate this outer line and then make those muscles so these are peroneal muscles we've got the muscles down here we just don't have quite the same of higher but but making her go into those lines to release enough in that fascia so that we can get some muscle control and alignment at the ankle again, right? So you might even go back to simple, those simple things just to find her foot in underneath her leg and the alignment of her foot underneath her leg. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, what, any other questions? And if not, then I'll throw in one other thought for you about a similar thing. Yeah. Okay, so one other thought would be, and um, Allegra, you and I share a, a very hypermobile client who has a really hard time activating. When you're dealing with hypermobility, right, it changes the game a lot. So you take you kind of have to take stretching out of the picture and work for stability all the time. But a lot of times it's for activation that you need to find. And some people are aware and some people have no awareness. So these little tools that we're using also that we've been talking about are excellent for people who are hypermobile. So the inner thighs, activating the inner thighs with subtlety. So using a ball and using sort of that submaximal activations, right? Squeezing in between ankles, squeezing in between knees, just enough to get the right amount of contraction to put the body in, in, its, in its natural state, in its natural lines, but just giving the little feedback and little cueing to get there. 
So um, similar to what we talked about, somebody with a hypermobility issue, you could do this with, and people who tend to grip, like either, it's usually one thing or another, right? If they're hypermobile inner thigh or psoas, psoas, I would say, and piriformis are a little more common than the inner thigh grip, but they'll grip somewhere to, con to control the lower chain when there's not enough stability in the pelvis and center. So always coming back to that center or finding ways to support the center. And one great way to support the center is to activate pelvic floor. So that's why these inner thigh things, training the feet in. I actually had that, uh, my hypermobile client today um, turn in and do just very, just maybe five little squeezes with the little feet turn in. And then we turned the feet back and all of a sudden her pelvic floor was working for her. She, she got so much seat, more stable just from five little presses with her feet turned in. So it's interesting how it just takes a little bit sometimes to help them find and activate a certain part of the body or a certain set of muscles. So um, playing with those submaximal contractions, playing with the breath to assist can be super helpful when you see somebody in that kind of a spasm that you're talking about, Genevieve, or when somebody can't activate a muscle group, as in somebody who's hypermobile and can't get the muscles on. Yeah. Great, you guys. Yeah. Any any other thoughts or questions? The theme that I've been playing with this week um, is the back body line a little bit. And so the the other thing you might think about is what are what are the lines in the body? And even if you what that sounds like a complicated concept, you all as flood instructors know those lines. And you know, um, we, we know that we do flexion exercises, you know that we do extension exercises. And it's not just muscles that are working in those body lines, right? It's fascia and connective tissue that also work through or are stretched through or open through those lines of body work. So today, for example, I tried to get length through the back line of the body. So um, lengthening through the feet, through the heels, and out the head all at the same time to get that work through the back line of the body, um, which is used in so many ways. So maybe just a challenge for you this week is to play with the idea of what, what could that back line of the body be? How can I activate the back line of the body? And then how could I support the back body line, right? So if we're talking about musculature, we're talking about back extensors, neck extensors, we're talking about glutes, we're talking about hamstrings, we're talking about calf. And actually, I like to include plantar fascia in the back body line, right? So the whole bottom of the foot as part of that back line to complete the circle back. So if I want to open that line, think about things that you could do to open that line, but then how do you support that line? Right, it's all the stuff on the front side that has to support you to be able to open and use that back line. So play with that idea. Maybe we'll, if, you, if we don't have enough case studies or don't have, or if it's something that's interesting, we can bring it up next week if you wanna play with it. I think it's just, it's one of my favorite topics and concepts. So um, if you want, we can tell about that next time too. Yeah, and if you guys have case studies that are difficult or that you want to talk about or that you want more ideas for or that you want to share because they were just incredible stories with us for case studies so that we can all learn, um, you feel free to bring it up or send me an email during the week and I'll be sure to be able to include it in our discussion next time. All right, then. Great, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And um, I look forward to seeing you guys all again next week.